4 o'clock presentation on Tuesday the 28th of August. We'll come back now to the continuation of the story of this movement and the experience we've been through. And as I was saying as we closed our last period, the time was drawing near for my disfellowship from the Seminary Adventist Church. Now about this time, oh, well first of all when Pastor Hollingsworth uh, found that <coughs> we, come, we exhausted um, any further possibility of going anywhere together, he then said, well, Sister White says if we have new ideas, we should submit them to, to the brethren of experience. And if they see no light in them, we should abandon them. Well, I said, these are not new ideas. This is the message God sent in 1888. I, I didn't get it up. This message has a divine credentials and we don't need to have any human credentials for it. Well, he insisted I write to the, um, the visitor to go to the second mile. I said, OK, I'll write. So I wrote to Pastor Clifford, who was then the president of the Australasian Division, briefly outlined to him the um, uh, request made by Pastor Hollingsworth and said I was prepared to do this, but I needed some directives from him as to how to go about it. Well, he wrote back and uh, advised me that, that unless I could give an unqualified promise to abide by whatever decision the committee came to, I, I didn't need to even submit my material. Well, I was rather, I was, I was rather quick to uh, see what that all meant because he was asking me to submit my future spiritual life to abandoned men in Australia who already had betrayed the Advent message, who were supporting the change over to the various new teachings which had come in and I certainly was not prepared to do that. When Sister Wife says the brethren of experience, she means men of deep spiritual experience who can be trusted to come back with a true evaluation of what you've written. And anyway, I said to myself, I don't need to write to them because I have the spirit of prophecy endorsed in for Wager and Jones's message, and that's all I'm teaching. So I wrote back and said, no, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be involved in that kind of promise, and so... That opened the door then for the final stage and I got a letter a few weeks later advising me that on a certain Tuesday night, March the 20th, 1962, there'd be a meeting of the College Church Board to consider, to consider my name as a church member and uh, I'd be welcome to attend if I wished, but that was up to me. My first reaction to the prospect of standing before all those former friends and fellow workers was very negative. I didn't want to go down there and, have the or and face the ordeal. But then the conviction came to me very strongly that I ought to um, go and give a witness to my faith and I agreed, I, I agreed in my heart to do so. But I felt a very profound sense of fear and uh, apprehension at the prospect. So I, but I, but I remembered the promise in God's word where he said we'd be given the courage necessary at the hour when the courage was needed. So I went and, and uh, asked God for the courage after which I felt no better. I felt just as nervous and apprehensive as ever. I didn't worry about that because I knew that when the time came, when the need arose, then I would realise the blessing. So three weeks later we drove down to the college church and to cut a long story short, they took my name off the church roll that night. And I was free and very happy to be free and have been free ever since. A few weeks later we went back to Australia and for the first time really came into contact with the Brinsmead movement. Uh, knowing I, uh, ha <coughs> having learned I was coming back to Australia, they organised a big combined gathering at Benora Point where Bob, Bob Brinsmead's home was about three to four weeks after I arrived back in Australia. And naturally, of course, I presented to them the message of bondage to freedom, Romans 7 and 8. And to my amazement, it caused a tremendous uproar amongst the Brinsmead followers. And I said to them, I said, what are you, what, what's the trouble? I said, I'm only preaching your own message. And I opened up God's eternal purpose and read it to them. I opened up Wagner and Jones and read it to them. I said, why are you uh, rejecting me when I preach the very message you pretend to stand for? Well, they had to cool down then, of course. I had a, an, ace, an ace card to deal uh, with them with. But from that moment on, I became a suspected teacher so far as the Brinsmead leaders themselves were concerned because they, they, they had grown to preach very strongly the idea that there's a soul cleansing in the judgment and not before. And here, here was I teaching a soul cleansing today. And of course the two messages didn't go together very well at all. 
But there were several people who did believe, and uh, the group in Mwarambar, where, where I was now living, were quite clear on the mission and loved it very well. Now, we were now moving down toward the 1962 General Conference session, which took place in San Francisco that year. As I mentioned yesterday, this was the year of final decisions so far as the church was concerned and if the delegates in session did not reverse the wrong decisions made during the previous 12 years then the church of course would come to the point of no return although we didn't realize that at that point and down in the Wollum bar where we had a group of Brinsmead folk who really believed in Romans 7 and 8 we spent many hours in prayer asking God to influence the leaders so that they would reverse the bad decisions made during the previous 12 years. At the same time, there began to dawn upon our minds the fact that Bob had been teaching the first angel's message essentially and so had, so had I more particularly, of course, in the preaching of the gospel and the, second must be, the first must be followed by the second. And therefore we... Uh, began to realize that there would be another messenger arise and the other messenger would proclaim separation from the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, recognizing that she had gone past the point of no return. Now, a certain individual named Reg Bladwell came up from Sydney. Now, I should mention, by the way, that none of this... this, this was just uh, sort of uh, uh, talk amongst ourselves. It was something we were thinking about. We were not active, uh, agitating it or talking about it elsewhere. We were not writing, writing about it or, or trying to convince anyone about it. It was just, just thoughts in our minds that we were talking, talking to each other about. And the Brinsmead people themselves up in Brisbane didn't even hear about it, the Brinsmead family. Well, um, as I said, um, well, before Reg Bradwell came up, i just forgotten the point here. Yeah. Shortly before the general conference was due to meet, a letter came from some Brinsmead follower in America to the parents of Bob Brinsmead in Benora Point, New South Wales, and Hope Taylor was present at that same point of time when the letter arrived. And this letter said that Bob Brinsmead and Hudson, Al Hudson, had split, that Hudson was going to go back to the church again and he was going to take as many of the, the awakening with him as he possibly could, and that a special church triumphant magazine was coming out in the very near future announcing his decision and calling upon all the believers to go back with him to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, but Bob Brinsmead was opposed to this, was standing staunchly for separation. Now this demonstrates how strongly the Australian Brinsmeadites felt about separation back in 1962, just before the General Conference session. They were totally for it, in the strongest possible sense of the word. And Hope Taylor, who was a very impulsive kind of person, was rushing home to Brisbane to put, put out a counter paper against this purported statement by Al Hudson. Well, I was alarmed by her impetuosity and I said to myself, here we have one witness from America, just one, one person writing. We have no proof that he's staying in the truth. He could be just a mischief maker. And so I, I telephoned to Brisbane and talked to Hope and I really had to talk to her very earnestly to wait, please, do not put anything out yet until we have proper verification of this report. And I said, let me write to Al Hudson himself and to Bob himself and ask him if there's any truth in these reports. And I and said, all right, she said, okay, do that. And the reply came back from each of them in turn to say there was no truth in the report whatsoever. But this seemed to, uh, to make Hope Tale even more suspicious of me than before. And then shortly after the general conference session, Reg Brad will come up from Sydney and uh, just as a matter of interest, I shared with him the idea that a second messenger was coming to preach separation from the church. And uh, Reg Bradwell listened, didn't say very much, and went off north to talk to Hope Taylor. And so oh, he said, have you heard Fred Rice Slater's views? She said, what are they? And <laughs> he told her what I'd been saying with a few embellishments, I suppose, and she just went wild. And she said, no, she said, that's altogether false because God's called Bob and Bob will take this message right through. He'll be the only leader until Jesus comes, which, of course, is a very serious family pride. And I don't subscribe to that kind of teaching at all. I firmly believe, for instance, that I have a role to play, but it will terminate sometime in the very near future. When the Lord's cry comes, I'll 
be retired, even laid the rest possibly, and others will take my place. In fact, I expect all you folk then to be the prophets and prophetesses who will take my place. And I say to you, well, may you increase while I decrease and do it well. The better you do it, of course, the better my work will, will have proved to have been. I'm looking forward to that happy day. I can sit back and watch all you folk do the hard work. <laughs> it's going to be good. But the idea that one man carries the work of God through from start to finish, of course, is entirely erroneous. Not even Christ upon this earth did that. John the Baptist began, Christ continued, and the apostles were to, were to have completed the work down here upon this earth. Anyway, um, a tremendous furor now developed and, and a demand was made for a big combined meeting at Benora Point again in a hall, the Terranora Hall. Yeah, the hall still stands, although it's getting rather dilapidated today. And uh, we went along there and I was required to stand up, first of all, and present my position in regard to the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church which I did, and I only presented the arguments which they themselves have been pushing for the previous four or five years. And to my amazement, Hope Taylor got up in an extremely spirited address to the people. She renounced and repudiated everything they stood for so far as church relations were concerned, whereas previously they had said the Adventist church was not preaching the third angel's message at all. Now they said she's the only church preaching it. Whereas they said before, be separate from her, now they said go back to her. Where they said before, don't pay your tithe, they, they were now saying, pay your tithe there. And I just listened amazed and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This tremendous reversal. And, um, and, and, and the people seemed to go along with her and, and about 75% of the audience, which was about 100 people altogether, maybe a little less than that, that day made it very plain that they would obey her instructions and go back to the church again, which showed they had no personal convictions of their own to stand by but a few of us about maybe 25 altogether said no we have put our hands to the plan we can't turn back if we turn back now this is to repudiate all we believe so far and to, and to deny that God's been leading us and therefore to admit that we had no right to stand in the first case I said we had good reasons for our separation stand so far and until I have good reasons to renounce it I'm going to stand out in separation and they said to us well you're making a grand mistake because out back then the Adventist Church of many, many souls who need this message and if you, if you go outside you'll never reach one of them, not one. I said, on the contrary, I said, if we go back in the church we'll reach none because they'll simply say that um, we're in the church and they're in the same church, we're all going to the king kingdom together so what's all the fuss about? Well, it turned out, of course, that uh, we were quite right in our assessment because as the years have gone by we have reached hundreds of people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I suppose several thousand, have come out and some have gone back again and we've, we've had a very successful work outside the church rather than in the church. Anyway, that night it seemed to me as if, the, um, as if my work was really at its end, really at its end. And I went home feeling very, very depressed, not, not for my own future, I felt depressed for the movement, I felt what a, what a, what a terrible thing to destroy what has been so long being put together. And uh, that night I lay, I went to my room to go to bed and as I lay in the bed thinking about the day's events, again the voice spoke to me and said, this day you have done this day's duty, just that. And what a relief that was to me. And I went to sleep and slept a beautiful sound sleep that night. And um, that was when the virgins, the foolish virgins all went back to the church again and that's where the Brinsby movement came to its end. From that time on, Bob Brinsby began to manifest all kinds of departures from the message until he told me one day on the phone, these, these were the exact words he said, he said, Freddie said, what I once believed I now reject, and what I once reject I now believe. What I once thought is for the birds, he said, it's not truth anymore, it never was truth. That's, that's what he told me personally. In a phone call from Benora Point, I forgot about maybe seven or eight years ago now, well, um, things grew very difficult now and uh, I had been barely supported financially up until this point of time and now to see 75% of my support cut off meant that clearly meant that I could no longer stand out in full-time ministry. So it appeared. And I had my contract with God and the contract said that when the finance dried up I was not to start raising money, I was to accept that and to go back to digging potatoes or whatever it might happen to be. And the prospect at this moment, I say the prospect was that that time had come. 
But um, it didn't come because to my surprise in, in a few days time instead of being so much money came in instead of being just uh, above water just holding my own I had three months reserve in hand. Now the money came from a number of people who had mistrusted the Brinsmead who had not identified themselves previously or even appeared upon the scene who had stored away tithes and offerings awaiting the day when God would direct them to use it and that day came when they saw my break with the Brinsmead camp. And so we had uh, a better financial position than we had while we were with the Brinsmead group. However, of the 25 who stood out with me, some of those began to weaken and fall away and uh, the group got smaller and smaller and smaller until I felt there would be nobody left very shortly. And you remember in early writing it says that, that the evil angels uh, put a black cloud between the believers and Christ to separate them from Jesus. I really experienced that. And I remember the time came when one morning late in 1962 I sat in my office in Western Street, Mwollombar feeling so depressed it just seemed as if a black cloud was sitting right on my head and I couldn't even see the ceiling in the room so, so real it appeared to be. And finally I said, well, I've had enough. This is the end of the road for me. I'm going to give up this ministry once and for all. And I knelt down and I said, Lord, I said... Uh, Thank you for the privilege of being your messenger so far, but this is the finish. I renounce my ministry now, and you can give it to somebody else. I'm through with it. And I really meant it. There was no play about it. And I rose from my chair, and from my knees where I sat in my chair, and I reached over for the Courier Mail, which is the, which is the newspaper which comes from Brisbane. And for the first time in my life, I planned to look in the positions vacant for a job. Now, I might mention that I've been one of those fortunate people who've never, ever once applied for a job in my entire lifetime, Work always seems to come looking for me. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to look for it. And this was to be the first time. And as I reached my hand out, I, I felt as... I can't describe this exactly. It was hard, it's hard to describe, but I felt as if a, a shock went through my whole body, as if God was rebuking me from head to toe for even thinking of giving up this ministry. And so real was that shock, so frightening, that I, my hand snapped back as if I had touched an electrical circuit. And I dropped down on my knees and I said, All right, Lord, I've got the message. <laughs> I'll carry on. I said, The responsibility for the movement is yours. And from that day, things began to pick up. Uh, Charlie Morgan and Alice Hunter came to see me and they, they, they had been uh, at variance with the Brinsmeads and they had quite a number of interested people all the way from Queensland down to South Australia. And Charlie invited me to travel with him down through, through, through the area, which I did, and suddenly I found my work extending quite considerably. The Believers in New Zealand stood firm. Then we, we um, and I went to, um, right, and in the meantime I began to get letters from some people over here in America. Two men, for instance, one was called Bob McCurdy from down in California, and the other was called John Doyle from somewhere up here in Canada. I've just forgotten the address now. I think it was somewhere in British Columbia, was it? Do you know where, do you know where he was, John James Doyle? Yeah. Where? James on in, the, in this province? Yes. Yeah, in British Columbia. Um, and both these young men were very interested. They, I don't know how they got to hear about me, but they had, and they got interested in the separation message. And they wanted me to come to America right now and preach it. And I said, I've got no direction from God to do so, I'm not coming. And I said, I want to come, I shall not be coming. Well, they, they wrote back as if I hadn't given the answer and said, when are you going to come? And I said, I'm not coming. Well, I discussed it with the believers down there and they all came, and I said, pray about it and give me your answer, what do you think about it? And they all came back and said, we feel that maybe, maybe some of it, not just yet. And so a few more weeks went by and um, probably a month, I think, or more, and I kept writing and I kept writing back and we had a lot of discussions by letter and I kept saying, we want you to come over to the States, we need you over here, please come. Well, finally, um, one morning I went down the street to do some letter mailing and buy some things I had to buy for the office and I dropped into the uh, shoe repair shop owned by Fred Ludlow and his wife where they, where they worked together. Now the Ludlow family have been faithful to the message and they're still very strong and very much with us. They stood through, us through all the storms and troubles and so forth. And uh, they said to me this morning, 
what's the latest news? What have you? What letters have you got lately? I, I just mentioned mentioned to them. I received another letter from Bob McCurdy urging me to go to America, but I I didn't think I'd be going. And they said to me, "What would it cost to go?" And I got suspicious of this question because these folk are very very careful with their money and uh, they tend not to make big expenditures. But I had a ticket to New Zealand already and I said, well, I said, I've already got a ticket to New Zealand, so this is a fare over there and back would be so much, I forgot what it is now. And I thought they'd say, oh, you'll never ever, that's too much, you'll never, the trip will never warrant that kind of expense. Instead they said, well, they said, we have got the money to send you, we believe you should go. Another one of my big surprises. And they told the story as follows, that um, a rich uncle of hers had died in California and left her quite a considerable legacy in his will. They'd taken the tithe out, but the Spirit of God had impressed him not to pay this into the treasury for the moment, but to put it aside in the savings account because God had earmarked that money for some purpose later on. So they'd done that. And quite often the family speculated as to what would be the, the, uh, where, the, where that money would be used eventually. <coughs> then came a day at last when um, they came down to breakfast and uh, one of them said I know where the money is to go and the other one said yeah I know too and they all said the same thing and when they compared notes they found they'd all been impressed the same night to give me the money to send me to the States right away well they said let's go down to the bank we'll give it to you right now I said no just a minute hold it not, not too fast I said I've got to go to South Australia it'll take me a month to visit Sydney and Grafton and Victoria and South Australia and then come home again I said during that month I said let's really put this into the test and ask God the question over and over again let's put the fleece out four or five times and when I come back <laughs> and when I come back if the, if the green light's still flashing I'll go if not I'll say I'm going to stay at home and they agreed so off I went to South Australia and uh, I tested the thing by asking all the believers what they thought and now they'd all changed their minds and said yes the time has come you should go and I came back and I felt that uh, I had no choice anymore so I went and bought the airline ticket and I went to New Zealand on the way and spent a day or two there and then I arrived in California on a Wednesday a late Wednesday afternoon about 7, seven o'clock or thereabouts and McCurdy was there to meet me now in the meantime things have been happening which I didn't know about. The arrangement was when I got to California Bob McCurdy and I with perhaps one or two friends of his would go to a quiet cabin by the lake, some lake somewhere in California and we spend a couple of weeks uh, together going over the message on deliverance from bondage and also the separation message and then we go out and begin to talk to the believers around, this, around North America. But in the meantime Bob had got to hear about this and he, he uh, had come out to California from Tennessee and had worked very hard on Bob McCurdy, McCurdy and had turned his mind against me and the message. I knew nothing about this. And um, Bob was very anxious that I should not gain a foothold in this country, in, in, that is in the United States of America, or Canada either for that matter. I keep thinking I'm in the USA here, pardon the Canadians. <laughs> it's so, so much alike these two great countries, I, I, I forget which is which sometimes. And uh, unbeknownst to me, they'd arranged a confrontation in the home of Dr. Welsh in Willits, California, which is up the 101 highway north of San Francisco. So they drove me there and we got there very late at night. They, I went to bed and woke up about 4 o'clock in the morning because of jet lag and walked up and down the road trying to uh, uh, kill the time. They all woke up and business began the next day. And I wasn't very happy with the prospect of facing Brinsby that day, but I had no choice. So Bob arrived at 8 o'clock with Tom Durst and Jim and Ethan Hill. And they said, you know, look, they said, and they had the sweetest, loveliest faces. They were so kind and nice. You know, just like a, um, well, we won't say what they're like. But it, was, it was only a front. It was, it, was, it was to give a nice appearance to certain people who were present so, so they wouldn't be seen in their true colours. And I said, now, we just want you to stand up and present your message and we'll ask questions as, as you go along and have discussion. I said, well, okay, but no questions till I make my first presentation. Now, what I did not know then but knew later was this, that Bob had had a meeting with Tom Durst and Jim and Ethelin Hill and maybe a couple of others and said, now look, he said to them, and, and this was reported by them to the McCoys who told me. So there's no question about the authenticity of this statement. And Bob said, look, he said, Fred Wright believes that God has taken away his evil temper, his old carnal mind, 
and has given him a Christ-like temper. He believes he's now a patient, long-suffering person, but you know and I know, he said, that's false theology, and therefore Fred Rice leaning on a false hope. He still has his bad temper, even though he doesn't know it, and that makes him all the more vulnerable. So all we have to, have to do today is to prove that by incessantly harassing him in a seemingly kind and, and Christian way but harass him continuously until he gets so frustrated and so angry he just explodes we'll have it all on tape we'll send all over the United States and it'll be the end of Fred Wright now I didn't know this member I had no idea they had this plan and so it proved to be they harassed me it was a real sort of attempted brainwashing situation and all day long they gave me no rest no peace they kept asking questions raising objections throwing in this idea and that idea one person asks a question, I try and answer him, I get halfway through the next person to, well, it would say yes but, and then I try and answer that one and this one at the same time, and it was a tiring, frustrating experience, but never once throughout the entire day did I have the slightest disposition to get angry with them, not the slightest disposition. I seem to be filled with a burden to try, to, to try and somehow get the message across to them. Well, finally, about 8 o'clock that night, and from 8 to late, there's 12 solid hours of, of being sniped at and, and so forth, and that's rather wearisome, as I found. And the sun was going down, and um, all of a sudden, Bob brings me, he exploded, he went to pieces. I mean, he went to pieces. And he turned on me, and he, <laughs> he lashed at me for about 10 minutes, or maybe, maybe it was shorter than that. I just sat there and smiled back at him. I was amused. <laughs> And then suddenly he began to, to sort of wind down and he just sort of tapered off and ended in the middle of nowhere, stared at me for a few more seconds and turned his back rudely on me and talked to the rest and I, and I had been dismissed, wiped out. Now, later in Tennessee, he, he, he gave his report on that meeting. He told the people that uh, I was a spiritualist. How did he know? Because that night he had tried in the... In, in the power and spirit of God to really rebuke me but he said so great was the power that came from me which was devilish power of course <laughs> I had to be a spiritualist because he was the son of God he was God's messenger and therefore if my power was hostile to his power then I had to be the wrong kind of power and therefore I was a spiritualist and he told me that so great was the power which came from me I wasn't conscious of it he was and that was his report so great was the power coming from me that he was unable to continue with his rebuke. He, had to, he was silenced, silenced by that power. And that basically called me a spiritualist. Well, um, coming back to Jim and Ethel and Hill's report of this, they went home from this meeting to, to Oakhurst, California, and they told Bla Mac and Blanche McCoy that they had this plan to make me mad that day, and they said, they, we tried all day, they said, and the thing which made us mad was the fact we couldn't make him mad. <laughs> And you won't believe how thankful I was to God for a message which can keep a person in an hour of trial like that so we don't break down and give a bad witness. And once again I found myself saying it's the Lord's doing and it's marvellous in my eyes. Well then, uh, next morning, which was thurs Thursday morning, no, Friday morning, that's right, Friday morning, I arrived Wednesday night, I said to Bob McQueen, look Bob, I said, let's get back to the original plan. I said, you promised me two weeks. I said, let's go some quiet place and spend those two weeks together. That was the plan. And you should keep, you should keep your side of the bargain. Well, he was very embarrassed by my proposition because he'd made some commitments to Bob Brinsby in the meantime. And I saw Bob talking to him very agitatedly uh, along the way. But, but Bob was now, Bob McCurdy was now between a rock and a hard place properly because he had me to answer to and Bob to answer to, Bob Brinsby to answer to. But finally he agreed to drive me down to Los Angeles, uh, yes, Los Angeles, to Loma Linda, to where his grandmother had a house, not too far from the Loma Linda Medical Center. Uh, and I was a little bit, they me messed around and made a very late start and we got in long after Sabbath, which I wasn't very happy about, but I had no control of the situation. And um, next day, Bob tried to avoid staying to study, which, but we eventually got down to it and didn't get very far when Bob Brinsby turned up on Sunday afternoon. And he came in with a, with a very, very concerned looking face and he, talked, he, he drew aside, he took Bob McCurdy outside and his grandmother outside and he told him, look, he said, you're harboring a spiritualist in there. He, he's a dangerous man. If you don't get rid of him real quick, he'll, he'll put a spook on the place and uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll all be demon possessed or something. And he, he told him and when Bob brings and makes a point, he makes a point. And so finally, Bob McCurdy called me aside and said, look, he said, I'm sorry, he said, but you'll have to leave. He said, we can't, we can't keep you here anymore. I said, okay. 
Now, here I was a stranger in a strange land with very little money in my pocket and um, nowhere to go, no friends anymore. But there, there was a family called the Cunninghams, who some of you may have heard of, who lived up just south of uh, San Francisco. And I thought, well, at least I can go and see them. They believe in separation from the church and they should give me a good welcome. So I packed my bags and uh, fortunately didn't have too much gear and I walked down to the, to the front gate and Bob, said, Bob McCree said to me, I'll, I'll drive you to the bus station. I said, no thanks, I said. I'll find my own way. I'd been walking, I had no car, no transport of any kind. But I was determined not to um, let him know my, my next moves because he was now an enemy of the message and Sister Wise said, we don't let the enemies know what we're going to do. We don't, we don't entertain them either. So I walked down the street and round the corner just as the sun was sinking in the western sky. It was blood red through the smog and it didn't look a very good portent to me at all. And uh, as I was walking down the street I was headed for the, uh, the, the sort of central Loma Linda area to a telephone and um, a young man in a red convertible with the, with the top pulled back stopped and said, can I give you a ride? And he was not, a, not an Adventist even, he was just a worldly young person. I'm sure he was an angel, really. I thought he was an angel. <laughs> so he drove me up to the Loma Linda Centre and uh, at that time there was a well first of all I should, to cut the story short uh, there was a man called Sherman Nagel who put out some little booklets and I felt the Lord kept saying to me call him and I called other people if, who were out and finally I called him told him who I was and he was quick to come and get me took me to his home and from there I telephoned to Cunningham So um, that closed that door down, but then, but Cunningham said to me, but he said, up at Oakhurst, California, there's going to be a camp meeting this week. It's already in progress. It's almost finished, as a matter of fact. If you go up there, you'll find people that are prepared to uh, listen to you. And I said to myself, well, this is a funny man, because you won't have me at his place on a spiritualist, yet he'll impose a spiritualist on all his friends. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have much consideration for them, but I, I believe the Spirit of God controlled him more than he, more than he realized. Because going up to Oakhurst proved to be an important uh, event. Now, just briefly, I mentioned the point that I met Mead Maguire while I was there in Loma Linda, and I think that was very providential because Mead Maguire, who wrote those fine little books entitled Life of Victory, His Cross and Mine, Lambs Among Wolves, which I think Al Hudson's personally printing, and you should get them and read them, uh, was a man who was alive and well in 1888. He heard Wagger and Jones preach for himself. He accepted their message and kept to it all during the intervening years and didn't die until he had handed the torch on to us. So there was a continuous link between Wager and Jones in the present time that has never been fully lost or, or uh, lost sight of. So I um, then decided to hurry up to Oakhurst and I left on Friday, on Thursday morning from the Los Angeles bus terminal and rode up to Fresno. I got out of the bus at the Greyhound Terminal and uh, I thought to myself, well, there'll be a train service or a bus service up to Oakhurst, so I'll get one or the other. So I inquired and found there were neither. So I said, well, I'll telephone Mac McCoy, but he didn't have a telephone. And all this was fortunate, extremely fortunate, as we shall learn in just a moment. So I thought, oh, well, there's only one way left. I, I'll have to start walking and I'll hitchhike. Now, the bus station in Fresno is a long way, believe me, from the northern outskirts of the towns, which I'd have to, which I'd have to reach before I could get a, a, a hitch, 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 hitch ride. So I started walking, and uh, after a couple of miles, I got tired of that game, so I hailed a taxi, <laughs> and he drove me to the edge of town. And in a few moments, a young man picked me up, again in the red convertible. It seemed to be red suns and red convertibles, was the, was the order of the day back then. And he drove me to a spot 11 miles short of Oakhurst. And, um, and he set me down because he was going off to a place called O'Neill's to the right and I was going straight on. It was now dark, thoroughly dark, and try as I might, no one would pick me up anymore because in the dark, of course, people are suspicious of hitchhikers and uh, so I walked and walked and walked and walked. Finally, I was very tired and um, I went up on an embankment and lay down to sleep and slept very soundly until midnight. But before I went to sleep, I lay there and I thought to myself, you know, there's not a soul upon the face of the earth, either friend or foe, who knows where I am. And here I am, far from home, in this, this vast 
unfriendly land of North America. And the desolation that I felt at that time was indescribable, really. I just felt so alone that it was, it was painful. But I said, never mind, I said, tomorrow I shall be with the fellow believers and it'll be wonderful. And that consoled me. I little knew what tomorrow was going to bring. Well, I slept till midnight and woke up as fresh as could be and unable to sleep anymore, so I got up and uh, walked on down the hill. And uh, to my amazement, in this absolutely lonely land, this empty land, not a house to be seen anywhere, here was a motel. Uh, the, uh, the, Black, the Black Hawk, I think it's called, the Black Hawk Motel. And um, it was already, I said, oh, I said, I don't need to waste uh, money there tonight. I'll keep walking and maybe pick up a ride. But I was desperately thirsty because California's a dry state, as you know, at that time of the year, August. So I went on down to a stream bed just past the motel and it was dry as could be not a drop of water in it and I thought I heard a mountain lion calling up calling a little further up so I said motel for me <laughs> <laughs> so I w w went back in for the princely sum of five dollars which is very very cheap as you know compared to today's prices I got myself a room for the night and slept till morning in the morning I persuaded the owner to drive me for a fee up to Oakhurst which he did and I got to Mac McCoy's place and no one was there no camping no tents nothing and I said, oh no. <laughs> and I called out and finally got an answer from a man called Swamer, the brother of Jack Swamer, the dentist. Um, and th this man was sunbaking up the hillside by himself and he came down after he dressed. And I said to him, I said, where's the camp meeting? Oh, he said, no camp meeting, no camp meeting here, none at all. But I said, where's Mac and Blaine's McCoy? Oh, he said, they're downtown shopping, they'll be back pretty soon. And you know, Whereas the night before I had something to bolster me up, now I had nothing. It seemed to come to the end of the road and I felt the despair and, and frustration and desolation and my whole being felt sick because of the, uh, the trial I was now going through. And I sat down on the front step which was about four inches above the dust and covered with dust itself and Mac and Blaine's McCoy drove up about 15 minutes later and I stood up to greet them and... Uh, Jack Zwamer, I mean, I've forgotten his first name, Jack's his brother, said to Blanche McCoy, oh, this is Fred Wright. And she said, oh, no, not the Fred Wright. <laughs> <laughs> not the Fred Wright, she said to herself. Not allowed, fortunately. And she was, she was, uh, she'd heard all the bad things about me, spiritualist and all kinds of terrible stories, and she was almost terrified of my presence. Yeah, I said, I'm Fred Wright, and... Um, Mac McCoy was, was more composed, of course, he wasn't a bit scared, and he said, well, that's good, come on in. He said, let's, come on in, make yourself at home. Well, I, I told him that I had been told there was a camp meeting in progress, but he said, no, there's no camp meeting in progress here, none at all, we don't even plan one. Well, I said, then I'll, I'll need to get back to Fresno. Uh, well, he said, I'll drive you down, he said. But he said, uh, we're expecting a family up, and we're going camping up in the hills tonight over the weekend a place called Kelty Meadows up toward Yosemite and you're very welcome to come if you wish and, 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 and share the weekend with us now the people coming up from Fresno were known to me I had written to them from Australia before and I thought to myself well the Sabbath is coming on if I go back to Fresno I'll have to spend the Sabbath in the hotel at, at considerable expense and uh, I'll then go to Canada and see John Doerr if that doesn't work out back to Australia I go so I said to myself, well, I don't want to put Mac to the trouble of driving me down to Fresno. I'll wait until these other folk come up and I'll go back with them on Sunday. And so I said, okay, I'll go camping with you. And that was very fortunate. Now, if McCoy's had had a telephone, I would never have gone up there. So it was a good thing they didn't. If there's been a bus service and got me up there on Thursday night, I still would have uh, left again on Friday morning for sure. So all these things were fortunate, even though they seemed very hard and difficult at that time. It was, it was, it was essential that I stay at McCoy's place for the next few days in God's plan. But everything at that time seemed so black, and the McCoy's seemed so distant, and I didn't. And they told me that Hills lived next door. They told me that they themselves more or less believed the Brinsmead message, and I felt that I had no friends. And the devil sat on my shoulder and said, Ha ha, he said to me, you've made one grand mistake coming up here. Brinsmead is the man of God. He's got everything under his control and you're just one big failure. And there my ticket was, my pot was this return ticket to Australia. And down there I, was, I had all my friends and loved ones. And I said to myself, all I have to do is go to San Francisco, step on a plane and go back to paradise again. Compared to this terrible spot I was in. 
and I became so distressed I really feared for my mind and I believe I had a little foretaste of Jacob's trouble right there and then and, and I became so distressed which, which is unusual for me I'm a very stable person as you people should know <laughs> hope so that I actually grabbed the pad and began to write anything something just write about Bonnie to film just write 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 keep my mind from becoming unhinged but we had lunch which I wasn't a bit um, had, had very little taste and then Blanche McCoy kept asking me questions and how she irritated me. Because I thought to myself, here was, a, here was a woman who was just being curious. I didn't realise she was a, a hungry soul at that point of time. Well, we went down to Oakhurst to wait for these folks coming up from Fresno and they waited and waited and waited and they didn't come. So finally Mac in desperation said, OK, well, we'll just forget about it and we'll go. We learned that they arrived three minutes later. But fortunately, three minutes later, because it was essential I had the McCoy's to myself for, the, uh, for that Sabbath up there in the mountains. Well, we got there and um, before we went to bed that night, we got there late afternoon, we, we made a campfire, we cooked the supper and then we talked around the table, camped over for quite a little while and Blanche kept asking me questions. I began to realise she was really asking for an explanation of the message. She was really a hungry soul. And uh, that was the end of my woes. When I found someone to speak the message to, all my troubles vanished. I forgot myself completely. All my distress was gone, and I preached the, preached the gospel that night. And um, <laughs> Blanche really got the message. It was beautiful. Listening number five eleven. <laughs> 